Welcome to session five of the course on spiritual gifts. And once again, as we go through these different sections, we ask you to follow along by reading in your Bible the verses that we are mentioned. Certainly record the verses to be looked at later if you don't have a Bible with you. There is an amazing verse in John chapter 16, verse 7. It's one that's overlooked most of the time, and yet it is very surprising that Jesus even said this verse. So in John 16, verse 7, again, in the upper room, Jesus says, But I tell you the truth, speaking to his disciples, it is for your good that I go, I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In essence, Jesus says, it's a good thing that I'm leaving. I mean, I can't imagine what would be any better than to have Jesus right there with you. I mean, imagine looking at his face, hearing his voice, standing next to him. That's what the disciples were doing. And Jesus goes, hey guys, as good as this is, it's going to get better. But it's only going to get better if I leave. Huh? I don't, I don't get it, Lord. Well, if I leave, then I'm going to send you a counselor, the Holy Spirit, and he will be with you. I think that would be a tough one for me to understand if I lived back then. And I'm sure it was very surprising to the disciples. They knew that somehow someone was going to come and take the place of Jesus and kind of help them the way Jesus did, but who's it going to be? Well, as we know, it's the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit is the least understood, the most neglected person of the Trinity. I mean, we get God the Father. We have a Father. We kind of understand what fathers do. Now, we have an earthly father, and, and every earthly father is sinful. They're going to do good things. They're going to do bad things. But overall, they're not God. So, being a father is very important. You give an impression to your children of what God is like. They get in their minds, God is like you. And that's very sobering for fathers because we know how far short we fall. But then we also get the idea of Jesus, the Son of God, because we either have brothers who are sons or we are sons ourselves. It's not too hard to figure out, okay, this is what a son is. Then you come to the Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit? We have no model to really understand it. Uh, is he some sort of a ghost, you know? Or is he some apparition that suddenly appears? We don't understand the Holy Spirit. And therefore, he's not often talked about. I'm not sure that I've heard very many sermons over the years I've been a Christian about the Holy Spirit. I mean, I've heard a lot about God. I've heard a lot about Jesus. The Holy Spirit, just a little bit. And yet, as we've talked about before, it's the Holy Spirit who's alive and active and living within us. And don't you think we should know something about him? And since the Holy Spirit is the spiritual gift, we really should know a lot more about him than we do. So just briefly, what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, at the moment you accept Christ, he comes and he indwells you. He lives within you. He is literally the person that we talk about who you open your heart to. Now, often we'll say, you know, to little children that you should open your heart to Jesus. Well, that's something for them to understand. But as adults, we can understand Jesus isn't on earth anymore. Jesus is in heaven awaiting the time he comes again. 
It's the Holy Spirit within us. So he comes to indwell and then he seals us, kind of like uh, uh, wrapping that you vacuum seal on something and there's no air in there, nothing can get in that would harm you. He seals us as a Christian, as part of the body of Christ, as belonging to God. And then Jesus calls him our counselor. So he guides us. He shows us the way. Jesus says he'll teach you and guide you into all truth. So he's a teacher, he's a counselor, he's a guide, and he also helps us with our prayer life because the Bible says we don't know how to pray as we should. And so the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and intercedes on behalf of us with the Father. So he helps us in our prayer life. But the most important thing that the Holy Spirit does is he's the source of the power to live the Christian life. You can't live the Christian life in your own strength. I can't live it in my own power. And when I do, I fall flat on my face. I stumble, I fall, I make a mess of it. It's only when the Holy Spirit has control of my life and it's His power pouring out of me that I really can live the Christian life. You see, it's all about our relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. It's all about relationship. And there's a very important passage that talks all about relationship in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. And in there, he compares our life to being vines and branches and where we get our energy. In verse 1 through 5, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then we come to maybe the most favorite part of this passage. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I am in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's as though when we're plugged into the wall, we have power. When we're connected, like a grape is connected to the vine that's connected to the branch, there's power flowing. It doesn't have to try to grow. The nutriment, uh, nutrients flow through the branch, down the vine, into the fruit, which grows. So when we're plugged in, we just grow naturally. We become more like Jesus. But when we sin, when we head our own direction, boom, it's like getting the plug out of the socket. We no longer have any more power. We need to remain connected to the Holy Spirit in order for us to be able to live the Christian life. When we don't, we live what's called a carnal life. We're living our own life on our own, by ourselves, apart from God, separated from Him as we were before. But then, when we confess our sins, and we admit to God that we have done wrong. And we repent of our sins by saying, I'd really like to head in the other direction. Then we're reconnected to God and then the power of, the, of God flows through us. If you're not connected, no power. If you're not connected, no gift. If you're not connected, no difference between you and anyone else who's a non-Christian. There's a famous researcher named George Barna, 
and he conducts research for the church on what Christians believe, how they're different, anything rela related to the Christian life. And one of the sad findings that he has found is, statistically, Christians are no different than non-Christians in the divorce rate, in the amount of addiction in their life, you name it, in financial difficulty, in children who are wayward and heading their own way, zero difference between us as believers and people who don't know Christ. That is a travesty. That basically says, Christ doesn't make a difference. So why is that happening? Why is the church showing so little power to a world that's longing for something that's true? Who wants what we have? Who needs what we have? It's because we are not plugged in to the Holy Spirit. We are trying to live the Christian life in our own power. And believe me, I fall in this category too often, far too often that I'd like to admit. But we're just a moment away from being plugged back into the power. All we need to do is humble ourselves and to admit, I've sinned. And Father, forgive me for my sins and cleanse me with your blood and restore me to relationship and fill me with your spirit. And we are walking the, the walk. We're walking the Christian life. But too often, we decide not to do that. Instead, we try to live the life on our own. If you would turn to Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse 3. There's a verse in here that absolutely blows me away. Now, Paul talking to the Galatians, he's talking to a church that's very much caught up in uh, worldliness. They're, they're not really living for God. They're trying to please God by doing good things. And in verse 3 of this chapter 3 of Galatians, Paul writes, Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? And Paul says, you guys are crazy. What are you doing? You're trying to live the Christian life in your own power. Can't be done. Can't be done. And then without going to the verse, you probably have heard this verse. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. It's not by strength, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What he's saying is, it's not your strength that'll do it. It's not the might that you have that will let you live a different kind of life. There's only one way, by my spirit. Only by my spirit. So if you look at your life and you say, man, I don't feel any different than my friends. I remember uh, when one of our presidents ran for office. He ran under this banner to Christians. Is there enough evidence in my life that I'm a Christian that I would be convicted in a court of law? Is there enough evidence in my life, in your life, that you're a Christian? That if that was illegal, you'd be convicted? And sometimes I have to say no. And so what's the answer? The answer is the relationship. We can't walk with Christ on our own power. We can only do it in the power of the Spirit. And this is a good verse for you to turn to. Ephesians chapter 5, looking at verse 18. This comes right before the section that deals with husbands and wives 
and uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and basically it's saying you can't do that unless you walk with Christ but in verse 18 of chapter 5 in, in Ephesians it says do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery instead be filled with the Spirit now why does Paul compare being filled with the Spirit to being drunk and doing things in debauchery. Here's what he's saying. If you put something in your body like alcohol, you're going to live a different kind, of, you're going to act differently. You're going to think differently. You're going to behave differently. And if you do that, that's going to lead to all kinds of evil behavior which he calls debauchery. And he says, instead of that, fill yourself with the Holy Spirit and you'll live a whole different quality of life. Now, this idea of being filled with the Spirit, very important concept. We kind of think of it as, you know, you go to uh, uh, get petrol from a station and, okay, you undo the cap and you put the hose in there and you fill up. That's not what's meant here. The term being filled means being under the complete control of the Holy Spirit. Him having total right to do whatever He chooses in you and through you. That's what being filled with the Spirit is. So when you have committed a sin, and let's face it, we're going to sin. And when we do, confess, repent, and Take it one more step and say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Meaning, take control. I, I can't do it on my own. I need you to be at the very center of my life. You're dealing with the controls and moving the switches so that I can get, lead the kind of life that you want me to lead. And when we do this, we find that God can do some extraordinary things in our lives. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel a little ordinary. You know, I look at people like Billy Graham, people like Mother Teresa, my own pastor, your own pastor. I look at these people and I go, I could never be like them. I'm just an ordinary person. Well, guess what? So were they. When we read about the Apostle Paul, he wasn't the Apostle Paul until God got a hold of his life. David, King David, he was a shepherd until God got a hold of his life. There is no such thing as an ordinary person when we serve an extraordinary God. And God can do and does extraordinary things through ordinary people. And what's the difference? It's that we're connected in a relationship with Him. Like the vine is to the branch. Like the plug is to the wall. He's our power source. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. One final verse to look at, which is the heartbeat of the gospel, which pour, Paul pours out, this is what I want to have happen in my life. Look at Philippians chapter 3. If there are ever a passage that says, this is how you should live the Christian life, or this is what I want, these are the verses. Chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Right before this, Paul has basically said, I may have accomplished a lot in my life, but I consider it all worthless compared to the 
greatness of knowing Jesus. And then he cries out, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. He says, this is what I want my life to be. First and foremost, I want to know Jesus. And he doesn't mean, I want to know a lot about him. You know, I want to study the scripture and have all the facts and all the information. He means, I want to know him personally in a real relationship. He says, I long for that. That's number one. And number two, he says, and I want to know the power of the resurrection. The same power that literally raised Jesus from the dead. I want to know that kind of power in my life. I want to know resurrection power. I want to know extraordinary power that I can't explain, that I can't take credit for. Give me that power. And here comes the part we don't like. Because I kind of like knowing Jesus. I'm all in favor of having the power of the resurrection. But then he goes on and he says, and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. Oops. Not so sure I like that suffering part, you know, that's kind of... But as we've talked about before, it's only through pain that we experience the joy of God. I shared my story earlier where tremendous pain in my life, the loss of my spouse. And yet now I can look and I can say, by sharing in suffering to just a small degree to what Jesus did, I feel real fellowship with Christ and I see how he has worked in my life. If you seek to avoid suffering in your life, you'll never grow. Not to mention the fact you'll never be able to avoid suffering. If you have not had something really bad in your life, wait. It's part of living. And that's where it separates the true believers from those who are the pretend believers. So suffering comes. It isn't that you want it. But when it comes, it's an opportunity to grow in Christ. And then he goes on and he says, becoming like him in his death, being like Jesus. And when Jesus died, he gave it all. He, he was willing to die for a greater good. And basically he's saying, I, I'm willing to be like Jesus, not only to suffer, but I'd be willing to give my life for a greater cause. Now we're talking serious business. And then finally he says, and someday to enjoy the resurrection from the dead. And actually what he says, and so somehow to attain the resurrection. And what he means here is, in a way I don't understand. I don't understand how I'm going to be raised from the dead. I just know it's going to happen. And I'm grateful to God that it will happen. When you are connected to Christ and you know him, and when you are connected, the power will flow. You can face the suffering. You will in fact, become more like Jesus, and you will be with him forever. And that forever doesn't depend on what we do. It depends on who we know. You know, the most wonderful thing about the Christian life is it's not what we do. It's who we are. It's not about how competent we are. It's about our character. It's not about how good we are, how many people we've touched, how many people are different because of our lives. None of that matters. Number one concern in God's uh, existence is who are you as a person? Who are you becoming as a person? And for that, we need to turn again to Galatians 
for one final verse. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And again, I'm sharing verses that are very familiar to people, but very important. God says, character always trumps competence. Character is always more important than competence. Who you are, number one. What you do, number two. In the term of God's priority. And how would we know that we're growing in character? God tells us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there is no law. You remember the uh, analogy that uh, John uses that you have the vine and you have the branches and we're the fruit. The fruit is the character being developed within us. These fruits of the Spirit are naturally developed just as the grape naturally ripens when connected to the vine. It doesn't try to, it is. So as we continue our study of spiritual gifts, the most important thing is the Holy Spirit and our relationship to Him and what He's doing in us first and then what He's doing through us. As we continue in the next session, we're going to take a look more in depth about spiritual gifts, what they are, um, going through a more in depth analysis of each of the gifts so that you can begin to gain an idea of which gift you may have. So that when you go out and serve, try it on for size. Much like you go to the store and you try on a shirt or you try on some slacks. Go out and try the gift. And if that doesn't work, try another gift and see how that works until you know which gift it is.